Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to this Earth Journalism Network webinar on navigating the high seas, a deep dive for journalists. We're so pleased you could join us today uh, for this very important topic. This is a, a subject that we at the Earth Journalism Network have long wanted to cover and support. Uh, it's, it's such an important issue. Um, the high seas, these are areas beyond national jurisdictions. Uh, they represent roughly 50% of the planet's surface. And at the moment, there's very little management of these crucial areas. So we're gonna be talking today about what are the prospects for such management, what we can, what, what is, uh, there's a, an important treaty being negotiated and there's a lot of discussion about how to go about uh, regulating and, and uh, managing the high seas. We are pleased to have a, an outstanding group of panelists who I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. But um, first, please let me introduce the Earth Journalism Network itself. EGN, we are a project of Internews, the global media development organization. Uh, we are also a global community of over 14,000 journalists from more than 180 countries around the world, all dedicated to improving coverage of the environment, the ocean, and climate change. Um, we offer a lot of opportunities for journalists. If you are a professional journalist, we encourage you to become a member of EJN. It's very easy. You can just go onto our website at www.earthjournalism.net and registration is free. And you'll find there lots of resources and lots of opportunities uh, including story grants that we are offering to all journalists now. Uh, you are welcome to apply for story grants about the high seas. So this is an opportunity if you've uh, wanted to do a story about the, the, um, the regions beyond national jurisdictions, this is a chance for you to do so, to get some support, some funding, and some mentorship to do so. Uh, so please check out that opportunity on our, on our website. Um, so let me now turn to this uh, webinar. Again, we're very thankful to have uh, a great group of panelists with you. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is gonna kick off our project on the high seas. And with us today, we're very pleased to have, for speaking first will be Christina Gierde, who is a senior high seas advisor for the Global Marine and Polar Program at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, Christina has uh, been practicing law on these topics for many years, and she's going to be speaking on the importance of the high seas, its connection to uh, climate change and biodiversity, and I'm sure other issues. Uh, next up, we're going to have Peggy Callis, who is the director of the High Seas Alliance, also an environmental lawyer with over 30 years of, 30 years of experience on international environmental policy issues. Peggy's gonna be talking in more detail about this uh, crucial treaty currently being negotiated through the United Nations. It's, um, it's called the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions Agreement, um, and, or you might hear it referred to by its acronym, BBNJ. So that's an acronym you probably need to become familiar with. Thank you, Peggy, Peggy for, for joining us. And finally, we'll have an outstanding journalist, Shannon Service, an investigative reporter and documentary director uh, whose feature uh, documentary, Ghost Fleet, was nominated for a 2020 Emmy Award for Outstanding Cinematography. And she's gonna be talking more about how we as journalists can do a better job of covering the high seas. Um, before we start, I will just uh, talk a little about the format for the webinar. Each speaker will have roughly 10 minutes uh, to present. Um, if you have questions, we encourage you to ask questions, of course. Please put them in the Q&A feature. You'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. That is where you should put your questions. We'll be moderating, curating the questions for the panelists. Um, uh, the chat is for other conversation, uh, please do not put your questions in there for the panelists. 
again, the questions should go in the Q&A feature. Um, uh, after each present, after the three presentations, we will have time for, for discussion and for questions and answers. So um, please stick around for that as well. But now I'm gonna turn it over to Christina, who's gonna kick things off. Please, Christina, take it away. Well, it's a tremendous pleasure and honor to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us and for your interest in the high seas. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and walk you through some of what we've learned about navigating towards a, a new UN treaty for the forgotten half of the planet. Um, please let me know if you're not seeing the full PowerPoint presentation. That's, um, so you've already gotten some of the basic acronyms down flat. So it'll make my life much easier. But um, to give you a sense of place, we are dealing with the high seas, which is the ocean that is two, um, approximately 200 nautical miles from coastal shores, uh, coastal baselines, um, the dark blue, as well as the international seabed area. And that is the ocean floor beyond the extended continental shelf of nations and also beyond the exclusive economic zone. So it is literally about 60% of the planet, but to date, less than 1% has been protected. It's a vital part of our, ocean, of our planet. Indeed, many call this the ocean planet. That was, but it's still being, um, despite the many benefits that the ocean provides, it is still being beset by a wide range of um, impacts that have many negative and indeed synergistic impacts, meaning they make one another worse. Uh, for example, we've only recently discovered that whales um, help to stimulate productivity in the surface waters where they swim, eat, and poop. And then they also take that precious, um, those precious nutrients down to the deep sea floor where they actually serve to sequester carbon for many hundreds of years. Um, the ocean is a complex ecosystem that we're just beginning to learn um, how it functions. And yet our human activities are threatening to start taking it apart. Uh, we have pollution, including plastics, overfishing, um, climate change, all of these as negative impacts. Climate change is literally turning our ocean upside down. It's separating um, animals from their food. It's um, separating oxygen from uh, where it's needed uh, into the compressed water surface above. Seabed mining is a new activity that hasn't yet begun, but the International Seabed Authority is developing new regulations without really indication, any indication that we'll be able to control new sources of um, toxins, of sediment, as well as noise, vibrations, and light that this new in industry could introduce into our ocean commons. Uh, so we're at the brink of both a exciting new international agreement to conserve and protect marine biodiversity at the same time as delegates in the United Nations in Jamaica, International Seabed Authority, are talking about unleashing an entirely new industry. Um, as we mentioned, the um, BBNJ agreement, here's the full um, name for it. Um, it's important to note it's under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is widely regarded as the constitution for the ocean uh, that sets forth the, the rights, obligations, um, and duties of states in the various ocean zones. In the high seas, states have an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. They also benefit from the so-called freedom of the high seas. Unfortunately, to date, we're seeing much more emphasis in management on extracting benefits, i.e. fish, minerals, and other resources than we are in figuring out better ways to protect and preserve. That's the new opportunity that this BBNJ agreement offers. It's a way to expand the toolbox to address cumulative human impacts, especially under the multifaceted challenges of climate change, to knit together our currently uh, fragmented system of governance that I'll get into more, um, to bring all players um, together to actually help to advance ocean health and resilience. We're saying we need all hands on deck right now at this critical time. Um, we also need to be able to allow all to share in the many benefits of the ocean. The ocean is richly productive if you give it a chance. Uh, it also is a new source of potential medicines, of biomaterials, all sorts of things that we'll get into more, but we need the capacity to be able to participate. And of course, to do all this, we will need a robust institutional, scientific, and financial support mechanisms. Those are the core messages that I want to share with you today. 
please allow me to dissect these a little bit more. Um, many of you have already heard that extreme weather events are becoming unfortunately more normal on land. The same thing is happening at sea, marine heat waves, areas of ex um, extreme and intense heat are becoming more frequent. My colleagues at IUCN have actually put together this um, information. They're becoming, um, the intensity is 10 times stronger, 50% increase in the past 10 years. Um, and we're also seeing this, of course, gives rise to more extreme weather, exacerbates the existing ocean stressors, leads to extreme pressure on biodiversity and habitat loss, as well as huge losses to um, small scale fishing communities, as well as to the large industrial scale fishing on the high seas at present. Um, Scientists, social scientists have started to look at the socioeconomic impacts of marine heat waves. We're already concerned about the ecological impacts, but they say we do have the tools at our disposal to better manage at least our responses through, of course, improved science forecasting, understanding ocean climate interactions so we can start to predict ocean change. But we also need to be able to quickly respond to these exacerbated pressures on marine resources like fish to reduce the stresses from overfishing, from um, reduction of prey. We need to lighten our footprint. We also at the same time need to be building and rebuilding this um, biodiversity and resilience of marine ecosystems through climate smart marine protected areas and much larger networks. At the same time, we need to be reducing other stressors and not introducing yet more. Um, how to achieve this in a fragmented ocean? As I mentioned before, the Law of the Sea Convention allocates responsibility for managing particular activities uh, to an array of organizations for um, fishing, regional fisheries management organizations, shipping, the International Maritime Organization, and for seabed mining, which is ostensibly operating on behalf of humankind as a whole, to the International Seabed Authority. The conservation authorities this, um, are more concerned with conservation, advising on sustainable use. They have very few mechanisms to actually adopt concrete measures in the high seas. And this is what we're trying to knit up in this BBNJ agreement. For even though the sectoral organizations, the International Maritime Organization uh, has measures to address particularly sensitive sea areas, there's no such PSSAs on the high seas. The regional fisheries management organizations have adopted areas closed to bottom fishing. This was only because of a United Nations General Assembly resolution calling on them to act uh, that Peggy was involved in in uh, many earlier days. Uh, and the International Seabed Authority is starting to design systems of particular environmental interest, but very carefully excluding areas of particular economic interest, even though we now know that these are one and the same. The minerals that are um, sought after are actually the areas of highest biodiversity because they provide the rare substrate that or complex organisms need in order to survive and to thrive. So, we have been on this quest for a UN biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction agreement for many, many years, now basically two decades. Um, I've been involved for that long, hence the white hair, um, but I'm hoping to pass the baton and to widen the array of interest because we've, we're now at a crucial period because many of the people in this room, uh, August 2019, have moved on to new um, positions in government, in private sector. We need to somehow rekindle enthusiasm and imagination for what we can do as a collective whole in combating many of these dire ocean changes. So how can the BBNJ agreement help? It can help to provide a global perspective on what is needed for biodiversity conservation. It can provide that head to guide direct and actually take direct action at the same time as enabling smart tentacles to go about and do what they need to do, but better informed with the best science information to take those wise decisions to conserve biodiversity. The specifics of the agreement are um, four areas of area-based management tools like marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments to underpin um, sustainable um, activities, new and emerging activities need to be informed by what the baseline is and what the potential impacts are. Marine genetic resources and questions about 
uh, sharing the benefits as well as capacity building and um, technology. Um, that's going forward. Um, it can also deal with marine protected areas, as I said, to proactively protect ocean biodiversity, environmental impact assessments. So we have a common process, um, both globally to ensure accountability and independent scientific review of what the sectoral organizations are doing to make sure they're informed by the best possible standards. Um, as I said, we also need to be lifting and expanding the capacity of all nations to engage in scientific research technological development, as well as basic implementation of the BB&J agreement itself. Um, I could go on about marine genetic resources, but just so you know, the main focus now is on monetary benefit sharing, but marine genetic resources have a wide range of benefits from biodiscovery to inform industrial processes, new technologies, as well as conservation and management. And so to bring this to an end, we're really looking for a smart, um, frontally focused um, institutional structure that's able to provide direction, mandates, improve tools and technologies for international monitoring and compliance, utilizing things like Global Fishing Watch, bringing um, science to bear, bear on all our decision-making and providing the necessary funding for research um, innovation as well as implementation. So with that, I will pass the baton back to uh, Peggy and to James. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christina. Already has generated lots of questions in my mind. Um, if you have questions out there in the audience, please remember to post them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And for now, I'm going to turn it over to Peggy, please. Peggy. Thank you so much, uh, James. And I uh, just want to share my screen. Um, and thank you, uh, Christina, for that excellent uh, presentation. It's always difficult to follow Christina because she's just a, uh, a, a mountain of information. She's a semi-scientist, even though she's a lawyer. And Christina, I've worked together for almost 20 years now. Uh, she's also a, a semi-scientist and fantastic. So. Um, with that, I'll uh, start my presentation. I just have to get to the beginning. It doesn't want to advance. Let's see here. Hmm, it seems a little stuck. Uh, this. Okay, maybe now. Okay, thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, so thank you again, Earth Journalism Network. It's really um, a pleasure to be here and really delighted for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about these important treaty negotiations that Christina just referenced, as well as the role of the NGOs in this process. Um, so just briefly, the High Seas Alliance is a partnership of over uh, 46 environmental NGOs, in addition to IUCN, Christina's organization, and we came together in 2011 because we saw that there was this huge gap of um, uh, gap in ocean governance, and it was so important to um, so many of our organizations to really um, bring to fruition this treaty that would bring legally binding um, um, uh, provisions under the EU and Law of the Sea Convention. So um, as Christina mentioned, though the High Seas Alliance came into uh, uh, its partnership in 2011, Christina and I and many others have been working on this since the discussions first happened um, in 2006. Um, so it has been a, quite a long time. Um, so again, um, Christina also showed you the map of the high seas. What exactly are the high seas and why are they important? Why should we care? So some say they are the forgotten half of our planet. They are its biggest biosphere. They make up 70% of the world's ocean and half the surface area of our planet. Um, the ocean is a huge climate regulator and makes our planet habitable. So whether you live near the coast or in a landlocked country, it provides the oxygen for every second breath you take. Um, because the high seas are a global common um, uh, beyond national jurisdiction, and again, the areas beyond national jurisdiction on this map are the pale blue areas, and you can see the, the, the great extent to which the areas beyond national jurisdiction make up our global ocean, right? The, the national areas, the 
exclusive economic zones are only 200 uh, nautical miles from a coastal state's border. So the rest is areas beyond national jurisdiction, which we refer to as the high seas. There are some nuances there, but for public information, we call it the high seas. Um, but it's shared by everyone and belonging to no one nation. So essentially, the high seas begin where national oversight of the ocean ends, and that's part of the problem. So the high seas are a vast expanse of, of life where great whales and sharks and tuna migrate with underwater mountain chains that span the areas and play host to diversity of marine life and species that we are now only just beginning to understand and much still remains undiscovered. In fact, we know less about the deep sea than the surface area of the moon, than the surface of the moon. But we do know, as Christina referenced, that we are in the midst of unprecedented threats to ocean from human activities and in the span of just 100 years, we've managed to do quite a bit of damage to what has existed for a millennia. There are still pirate fishermen by the thousands and too little enforcement on ungoverned ocean spaces. There are plastic patches floating in the Pacific the size of small countries and climate change induced ocean warming and acidification is decimating coral reefs and further exasperating these human impacts on the ocean ecosystem. And to, to add to that, the deep seabed mining is a looming reality. So it's hard to predict what unforetold and emerging issues lie in the ocean's future because the major problem is that the current ocean government's framework is inadequate. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, is the legal framework for all activities in the ocean, but it was negotiated in the 1970s at a time when technology to go deeper and farther into the ocean wasn't foreseen and therefore it has serious gaps. So in this convention, there is no comprehensive oversight of all activities in the high seas. Instead, you have various activities that are governed by a patchwork of international, regional and sectoral agreements and organizations, all with different priorities. You have IMO that covers shipping. You have the International Seabed Authority for deep seabed mining. You have various regional fisheries management organizations that oversee fishing and catch allowances and a multitude of multilateral environmental agreements. So in some areas, mandates overlap and create complicated jurisdictional is issues and elsewhere there are gaps where no one has the full authority to act. And uh, there's also generally poor to no coordination with overlapping or neighboring organizations. So as a result in the high seas, human activities are weakly regulated and poorly enforced or not regulated at all. And it is incredibly difficult to take into account cumulative impacts to ecosystems from shipping, fishing, mining, and other activities. And at present, there is no global mechanism to establish marine protected areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So this is a timeline that we put together and you can see um, governments and civil society and ocean stakeholders have been discussing these issues for nearly 20 years at the UN and in capitals around the world. So these discussions began in 20, 2002 and evolved into an ad hoc open-ended working group. Then finally in 2017, um, a UN resolution was launched and that brought forward the formal UN treaty negotiations for a new BBNJ agreement. So this agreement would be the third implementing agreement under the Law of the Sea Convention. There's been two previous ones. Um, and this is the first time in 40 years that states have, governments have come together um, to negotiate a global treaty related to the ocean and the first ever to address biodiversity in the high seas to finally put this massive global resource under global protection. So makes sense, right? Um, so again, the BBNJ Treaty is charged with considering a package of issues, which Christina already went into. So I'm just gonna go right through that one. Um, so one of the most crucial aspects of this treaty is that it could provide a framework for the establishment of a network of well-connected and representative marine protected areas on the high seas, which could allow the ocean to repair and build resilience in the midst of so many stressors. Currently, only around 1% of the high seas are fully protected, and that's primarily in the Ross Sea in the Southern Ocean. But as we heard, um, and as, as many of you may have heard, the calls from many governments and scientists to protect 30% of the global ocean by 2030 as the minimum needed to safeguard biodiversity, avoid collapse of fisheries, as well as bolster the ocean's resilience to climate change. The high seas are the key to reaching this 30% target uh, since they comprise two thirds of the ocean. We really can't reach that 30% target without the high seas. 
So again, it could also operationalize a process for conducting environmental impact assessments for all activities that may have a significant effect on marine life. And because these are shared international waters, this is the only effective way to do this through a global UN treaty. And importantly, we want to future-proof this treaty so that it stands the test of time, not only for the next 10 years, but for decades to come. So what are the current state of negotiations? Well, after three rounds of negotiations at the United Nations, we are now in our final stage. We have draft treaty text on the table, much of which is bracketed and all issues are still very open for negotiation. So the fourth and final slated session had been scheduled to take place in March, 2020, but we've been postponed now for two years due to COVID. There have been no international gatherings and negotiations taking place. But now I'm pleased to say that it's been recently announced that they will go forward in just 19 or 18 days now. We have a clock on our website uh, counting down. So 18 days, um, we will go to the fourth round of negotiations, March 7th through the 18th. However, due to the COVID restrictions that the UN has imposed, there are, there are severe restrictions and it will make it a, a very difficult, uh, different type of meeting. Um, UN delegations can only bring one person, one government representative into the meeting room. Um, typically there's five, 10 dele delegations that have you know, over 10 persons in their delegation. So only one in the meeting room. And right now there is no observers, which means civil society, inter intergovernmental organizations, which is a, a real concern for us because we've always been in the meeting room making interventions. And at this point, um, that is not going to be possible. So with, this, with these adjustments, this raises some critical questions that are being discussed amongst government delegations. What will be a successful outcome of this fourth slated session? Will we be able to make sufficient progress in this next period with all these restrictions so that an agreement can be reached at this fourth session? And can governments muster the political will needed to find agreement over the difficult sticking points? All options are still on the table regarding the current draft treaty and the extent to which this agreement will move us beyond the current status quo greatly depends upon state's ambition and political will at this point. With new and emerging threats facing the ocean every single day, it's critical that we maintain momentum and heighten ambition to reach agreement as soon as possible. Since after the treaty is adopted, additional time will be needed for countries to ratify and implement the treaty. So just briefly on political will, just last Friday at, in, in Brest, France, at the One Ocean Summit, European Commission President announced the signing by heads of state. Now I think that there's um, around 48 heads of state that have signed a declaration urging the successful conclusion of these negotiations uh, of the BBNJ Treaty in 2022. This is long needed and we really hope this high level call to action translates to action in the negotiations because we have to go beyond the current status quo of, of governance to ensure that this treaty fills the governance gaps. So what are other opportunities this year um, coming up to also amplify this ambition? Um, we have the uh, Economist World Ocean Summit coming up in early March. We have the BBNJ negotiations in March, as I referenced. Then in mid-April, we have the one, um, the R Ocean Lao meeting. And then in uh, late June in Lisbon, we have the UN Ocean Conference. So over the next six months, these are big international meetings that we will be gathering at. We will be taking forward what needs to be done to make sure that we can bring this treaty into fruition by the end of uh, 2022. That is our goal. Um, I, I'd just really like to briefly touch on the role of what civil society does and how we, how we um, act in this process. So we, uh, we try to pull our efforts um, as the High Seas Allowance, uh, Allowance Alliance to reach out to delegates and countries with a singular message. So we're not approaching from all different vantage points. We really organize, we have different working groups amongst us and we try to go with a singular ask um, to governments. Um, we represent millions of constituents around the world and they know that. And we have the combined expertise and from people like Christina and other marine scientists and legal experts, ocean mappers, um, and we have regional representation in capitals around the world. So that's really helped us bring uh, a call to action to um, governments. Um, our work includes analysis and advocacy on legal texts at UN meetings, 
Um, we also are active through the negotiations, making numerous interventions, which again, it's a, it's a real concern if we won't be able to bring our voice forward at this next round of negotiations. Um, and capacity building, um, we uh, assist governments, we provide numerous workshops. I'm here in my uh, funky hotel room because we're having a, a workshop in Lisbon uh, starting this evening with uh, very progressive governments to build a strategy on what we want to do at IGC for, um, let's see, am I still sharing screen? No, you're not. I'm gonna have to ask. Uh, have to ask you to stop, Peggy. We're gonna have oh, sure. We're gonna have more time to talk. Absolutely. Don't worry. You're gonna have no more time to add on our discussion. But thank you so much. There's so much information there to dive into. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Shannon now. I think we might be starting off with the video. Shannon, you want to take it away? Hey everyone, um, we're going to play the video in just one sec from my film Go Sleep. But um, I want to first of all just thank. EJN, thank you, James and Amrita and um, everyone, because this is such a, as a reporter myself, investigative reporter and um, now filmmaker, uh, this is so critical and something that um, I think is long overdue. So both the, the grants and this webinar um, are fantastic ideas. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my trajectory from um, not really knowing much about the oceans as a journalist to becoming a, a very oceans focused journalist. And the hope is um, to kind of provide an entry point because um, what Peggy and Christina are talking about is so completely, it's very, very critical and it's a big story. Uh, and direct coverage of these negotiations is, is very, very much needed. Um, but also the ocean as a whole, uh, there's so many fascinating stories out there, but how to actually access those stories as journalists is um, always kind of a, a nut to crack. So one of the major problems from my perspective about oceans reporting is that the oceans looks fine. Um, you know, you see a, a top down version of a video of the ocean or a photo of the ocean, it looks the way it looked to our ancestors, it looks okay. Um, you take a, that same top down approach and you see what's happening um, in the Amazon or clear cutting in some rainforest, and you can see the devastation. So how do we tell these stories in a way that have human beings at the center of them and, um, and do get to these really important issues of governance that are so crucial? So to kind of crack that a little bit, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about my trajectory and uh, then play a clip here just in one moment. Um, I came to Oceans Reporting fresh out of grad school. I um, went to Berkeley uh, where James teaches. And uh, once we graduated, I turned to my friend Becky. Um, we wanted to report together and we started talking about, well, what do we want to report on? And she said that she had lived in Myanmar, also known as Burma uh, for many years. And there was a rumor in Myanmar that um, men and boys were disappearing from the villages and from the cities and that they weren't coming back. And the um, thought at the time, or at least the rumor, because there's not a lot of press freedom in Myanmar to say the least, so there weren't a lot of facts around this, but uh, the rumor was that they were disappearing onto the Thai fishing fleet and they were being enslaved and they were going out to sea and they were never coming back. So we checked around, we found out that um, the International Organization on Migration had actually released a report on this by a guy named Phil Robertson. And we reached out to him and said, you know, Phil, tell us um, everything you know. And it turned out that not only were hundreds of thousands of men and, men and boys uh, disappearing onto the Thai fishing fleet, but a lot of that fish was coming to the US. Thailand is the second largest supplier of fish um, to the United States, um, which is where, of course, we're based. And so we wanted to interest US outlets in this story. Um, and so we started with the question, and the question is, how do hundreds of thousands of men and boys just disappear? And uh, I followed that story. I'll tell you a little bit more about that on the other side of the trailer. Um, followed it through to a, a radio story for NPR, um, some reporting for the New York Times, uh, a bunch of story across platforms, and eventually into a film called Ghost Fleet. So Stefano, if you don't mind, please playing the trailer. เราถูกบังคับให้ทำงานเกือบ
ทบจะไม่ได้เห็นแผ่นดินเลยถูกตีหางกระเบียนตีถูกบริษัทตามล่าทั้งวันทั้งคืนวันนั้นมีผู้หญิงมาแกก็ถามผมอีกว่าแล้วอยากกลับบ้านไหมฉันว่าปฏิมาบลูมีเนสุยเนาะดูดีตาตาสีวะเนาะก็คือฉันจะอยู่คือมันเรื่องมันเกิด3 0 4 0ปีแล้วเนาะคนตายเยอะ5ปีได้ฉน้ำเชียงจ้ะ12ปีแล้วครับแล้วปุ้ยเมฆรู้ไหมว่ามาไปอินโดทำอะไรเพื่อคนอืมอืมโอเคแล้วเด็กกลับมาทำไมนี่เอาทูไกมาน This really depends of the wind and current ลูกเรือคนแรกเนี่ยเขาก็จะบอกว่าเพื่อนเขาอยู่ไหนได้ใช่ไหมหรอใช่ไหมตายพลตัวกู้ย่าดลิงที่เบซิน่าเนี่ยเขาไม่ชอบเราอยู่แล้วล่ะเพราะว่าเราไปรู้เนี่ยมาพูดได้เลยแลนด์ได้เลยก็เลยตัวตัวเราเราส่งคนมาด่าตะพ่อ Many people has been killed because of this issue. วินาทีคนนั้นไงมูตะไบอีกคนนึงตรงนั้นทำอะไรอยู่จ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะจ้าล่ะ Um, so shameless plug for my film there, but, um, I wanted to, to play it for you guys, um, to kind of ground a little bit in, in the discussion of, um, how all of these governance issues actually impact people and back to sort of my reporting story and to get there as quickly as possible. Um, when Becky and I started trying to answer this question, how do hundreds of thousands of men just disappear? Um, we managed to get a reporting grant from the nation for investigative reporting. We interested NPR in the story, um, and we flew off to Southeast Asia for a six-month investigation. We started with one man's story, a guy named Vinod Prum, who uh, was Canadian, I mean, sorry, not Canadian, he was Cambodian, and um, he entered into a trafficking network where one trafficker would sell the men to another trafficker across the border. As soon as they crossed the border, they um, had no money, didn't speak the language, had no passport, and um, were immediately very vulnerable. From there, they were taken down to ports and sold, sometimes by the police, onto fishing boats. So the level of corruption and people um, taking money, there were military um, at the border who were getting bribes from the traffickers. There were cops along the way who were getting bribes from the traffickers. The traffickers were making money trafficker to trafficker, and they were sold onto fishing boats. Um, where then the traffickers would be paid, the captain would be paid, um, but the men were never paid. So we followed the knock story to kind of get a sense of how this whole thing worked. And we realized quite quickly the importance of um, oversight, of trying to track the boats, trying to track what, trying to track what happens at these ports. Um, because currently the way, the reason that all of this is possible is that there's very little um, actual monitoring of ports and boats. And the reason that the, uh, the film is called Ghost Fleet is because um, one boat can come in and they can take 10 men on board. Um, they can go out to the high seas where there's very little surveillance, there's very little law, um, and they can do what they want. They can plunder other countries' waters. Um, they can throw men overboard who um, are disobeying them. They can come back with eight men and nobody's the wiser. So there's a huge, huge lack of governance um, in, a, in a really, really important um, place that covers most of the planet. So we started realizing how important that is. Um, and as we were filing the story for NPR, I became interested in this sort of broader tapestry and how to tell it through the story of one person. So I'll give one example, um, and then I think my 10 minutes are up. 
Um, I'll give the example of Tunlin. So in our film, our hero is named Patima. She's an incredible human rights activist who had this uh, issue literally come to her um, onto her doorstep. And she started working with the men who had managed to jump ship. They landed on islands, they landed in cities, they made their way back. Um, and her right-hand guy himself, Tun Lin, was enslaved for um, over a decade. And what happened with him is he was 14 years old um, when he was looking for work and he heard that there might be some good work on a fishing boat. And he, was, he went down to the port himself as opposed to being sold. Um, and he voluntarily signed up to fish, but quickly realized that uh, as soon as the boat pulled away, that he was very vulnerable. And, um, and you know, he hoped that he was gonna get paid, but it ended up that he never was. So his boat was taken directly to Somalia, where Somalia was in a bit of a um, collapse. There was not a lot of government. There was not a lot of protection. Um, because of that, of their natural resources at sea. Um, there was no police boats or, or Navy that was operational. So here's 14 year old Tun Lin on this boat taken directly to Somalia, where uh, because of the rich fisheries and the lack of governance, all of these boats from around the world had come to start plundering their marine resources. And as a 14 year old, he was forced to fish which is an uh, incredibly dangerous business. And, uh, and then he was shot at by other fishermen who came off to try to defend their territorial waters. Um, there are many analysts who I've read and talked to who believe that some of the Somali pirates um, were actually came from fishing and were so tired of all of these boats coming and plundering their resources that they started taking uh, bigger and bigger action. Um, at any rate, so Tun Lin is there, he's fishing, these guys come, they shoot at him, they finally, his captain says, okay, let's go to Indonesia and start stealing their fish. Um, we'll maybe get shot at less. So he ended up in Indonesia where finally he was able to jump ship and get back home. The reason I'm sharing the story um, in the context of sort of global governance is that this is the kind of um, cycle that we see again and again. When you don't have oversight of boats, you don't have oversight of ports, you don't have governing treaties of the high seas. When you don't have a cohesive approach um, to our marine resources, we see everything from gun running, drug running, slavery. Um, in Somalia's case, it contributed to food insecurity um, and eventually to international insecurity. So there's many ways into this story, some of which might be national, some of which might be local if you live near the ocean, um, and some of which are international. But uh, for me, that was the beginning of a career really of, of um, the last 10 years of uh, focusing just on the oceans. And um, my shameless plug for oceans reporting is that it's taken me all over the world. It's hard, um, but it's incredibly rewarding. And I highly, highly recommend it. So that is um, the end. Thank you so much, Shannon. A very inspiring story and very moving trailer. So I see a lot of comments on it in the chat. We've got some questions for the panelists, so let's jump right into them. And I think the big one, if especially for Peggy and for Christina, what do you see as the main sticking points in the negotiations? And if you feel uh, free to discuss it, which countries do you think uh, might be are being kind of most obstructive? Peggy, why don't you go ahead? And then Christina, you can you can follow. So yeah, thank you for that question. So as I mentioned, the the the, the text is all um, pretty open, and um, but I think all agree that probably the most difficult area is marine genetic resources, um, which is um, talking about the sharing of benefits from, uh, for instance, pharmaceutical um, discoveries. And so it's a very um, um, a very big divide between developing countries and developed countries as to where they fall on the sharing of benefits and all of that still needs to be sorted will the benefits will there be a sharing of benefits and if so will they be voluntary will they be mandatory um and as you can imagine some of the some of the governments that are involved with um you know pharmaceutical discoveries are less inclined to want to have to share monetary benefits benefits but it's a very important um 
as it should be to, to uh, developing countries to be able to, these are our global commons, they belong to all of us. So if there's benefits from them, they should be, they should be equitably shared. So that's one of the issues I would say um, with area-based management tools. Um, one of them is, you know, where will there be um, a decision-making process for the establishment of marine protected areas? And will the conference of the parties, which is the, the treaty body, will it be able to um, establish these areas and establish management measures where there's no body with confidence to do so. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, nuances as far as uh, where, what will be, uh, what will be the decision um, process for for all the elements. Will there will the conference of the parties be able to take these decisions? So the conference of the parties is the global body, and that's what we as environmental activists are really wanting the global body that speaks on behalf of all of us to take those decisions rather than leave it to the sectoral and regional organizations where it is right now. That would be the status quo. Um, and Christina, why don't you fill in because you you work a lot on this as well. All right, just to say on marine genetic resources, part of the sticking point is that uh, many of the developing countries are looking to the, the principal common heritage of mankind that is the foundation for seabed mining. And as we're seeing the chances of actually getting any financial benefits from seabed mining um, dwindling, uh, many are looking to marine genetic resources as another industry that has the potential to actually create monetary benefits that could be shared. The challenge of seabed mining is you're actually engaged in a destructive activity in order to promote and enable the conservation sustainable use. Uh, so there's a little bit of a um, disjunct there. Um, but the common heritage of mankind principle is really quite noble in terms of trying to say that we should be acting as trustees on behalf of humankind as a whole, that we actually need to be lifting the capacity of all. Um, but because marine genetic resources could be both financial and non-financial benefits. If we would actually look to a real solid um, financial support structure for enhancing implementation of all, there might be some ways to get over that. Um, I think Peggy already said marine protected areas. We have new players coming in like the United States who's been sort of quiet or not necessarily enthusiastic in the previous processes. Under the new administration, we're hoping to see much more proactive engagement, uh, much more ambition, and much more um, involvement with other countries. On uh, Shannon's field of uh, seafood slavery, Monica Medina, the Secretary of the Navy and the Commandant of the Coast Guard recently were in a webinar saying, we have the tools and technologies now through these eyes in the sky to better track seafood um, shipping activity, um, fishing activity, but we need to share these with our compatriots, the other nations. Can we not translate that attitude into these BB&J negotiations? Really exciting stuff going on and great opportunities. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so, but the US is not signatory to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So how, what does that mean for its participation in the BBNJ negotiations? And there's also a question about, would the BBNJ in some way cover human rights issues like the ones that Shannon has highlighted? Well, I say the um, US participation joining in the uh, Law of the Sea Convention has not stopped them not stop the US from being a very fervent supporter of the UN fish stocks agreement. So this is not um, membership of the UNCLOSE is not compulsory. Um, at the same time, I think there's long been a movement inside the US to actually go forward and, and ratify the Law of the Sea Convention, which would also be a lovely um, event because it would enable the Law of the Sea Convention to also evolve to, to keep up. Um, Peggy, you get the second question there. <laughs> Well, thank you, Christina, because <laughs> that's a tricky one. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say uh, when it comes to the, the specific questions of slavery, human slavery, um, right now that isn't a component of the BBNJ treaty. It doesn't mean that this maybe maybe once we have the treaty, we can start to look at other aspects that it could possibly include. But right now, that isn't that isn't within the scope um, because the treaty is for the conserva conservation for for um, marine biodiversity, and so it really doesn't fall into the scope of the treaty. That's not to say that 
Um, wow, I mean, th th Shannon, your, your movie blows us all away, I think. I was literally in tears while I was just watching that short clip and something has to be done. Um, and certainly, I think there's, I think, the, the increased global attention to the ocean in general, we just at the Brest um, meeting last week, um, there was huge support to now move forward in the same kind of manner that we did for the BB&J treaty for our new plastics treaty under UNEA. And maybe this is the next step also to look at human trafficking and what we can do because it's certainly, it's just, I mean, what's more important than human lives? Uh, biodiversity is important to the equally important, but wow, that just, um, we need to do something on that. So <laughs> can, can I can I just jump into that? Um, you know, my hope to, my hope is that, uh, and, and it's not just my hope. There's obviously a number of reporters and there's a number of activists and organizations around the world who have sort of ta who've taken up this torch of trying to look at. Um, while you know Christina and Peggy are doing the most important, most direct, like this, we need this is this is like the basic, most important stuff we need. Um, I do see the the issues of of human trafficking, um, in international food security, instability, everything that happens when you don't have that governance. I think we as journalists need to start making those connections so that they do come home, so that uh, it, you don't necessarily have to identify as a, a, an oceans person or an environmentalist, um, which you know I would argue you don't have to identify as either of those things to care about um, the, the high seas, but most people kind of tune out stuff that, that sounds a little bit too environmental. Um, and But they might be a little bit more impacted by human rights. They might be a little bit more impacted by how this actually, you know, if you um, don't have uh, secure oceans, then um, there's direct connections between how, for example, uh, Costa Rican fishermen who don't have the same, um, uh, fish stocks that they used to are now using their fishing boats, which are the least regulated boats on the ocean, to funnel drugs for the Colombians into LA. And this has been documented. Um, so, you know, we can actually find these other stories that, that I think uphold this really central idea of how important it is to have governance, cooperation, um, and security on the high seas for a whole bunch of different Issues and my hope is that you know that that'll flip too, so that uh, the reporting that we're doing and looking at these other how these other issues connect um, can support the the central effort of Peggy and and Christina to 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 really try to you know take all of these various different um, organizations that are currently trying to kind of hobble together to do something about the high seas and and strengthen and, and knit them together because there's so much that is at stake. Thank you, Shannon, and no doubt the same fishing fleets that are abusing human rights are also exploiting biodiversity. So they are Absolutely. all connected. Exactly. Can I ask um, a slightly different question is, how would the environmental impact assessments work? If there, it would there be a connection with the seabed mining uh, authority, uh, the International Seabed Authority in that if, if a, a company or country wants to embark on seabed mining, they would have to get an EIA done through through the BBNJ treaty or, and also, I mean, would the EIAs also cover fishing on the high seas in some way? How would that work? I'll jump in um, first is at present, the um, environmental impact assessments conducted by the environmental, um, by the International Seabed Authority do not include impacts on other industries um, like, Pisces fishing. They do not include full consultation processes. We're in the exploration stage, but even test mining can have an impact that we would like to be involved in. Uh, so the hope is that the BB&J agreement would lift the standards that all the sectoral organizations actually use. That So there is standard triggers, there is standard scrutiny, there is standard independence and accountability, um, as well as real thresholds for uh, both when you conduct an EIA and when you decide that we really either don't have enough information or the damage is too great that we really do need to wait until we either have better information or can manage an activity to avoid significant adverse impacts. The idea is you wouldn't have to duplicate EIA processes, but that the sectoral organizations would actually reform and improve their processes, but work in tandem with the BB&J agreement. Peggy? 
Yeah, that, th thank you, Christina. Um, yeah, and just to add that that's really one of the most difficult sticking points is what will be the relationship of this treaty body to these sectoral and regional organizations, not just on EIAs, but also on ABMTs, and where there exists a body with competence, can the BBNJ agree agreement, will it be able to um, uh, uh, step in where those bodies have, have an act? haven't acted and so there's um you know in each area we have um uh we have briefing papers i i, I welcome everyone to go to our website uh highseasalliance.org we have numerous briefing papers on all kinds of issues and and this is one of them on our positions on how we'd like to see the treaty treaty um step in but these are all to be decided it's a very um um politically um um heightened issue and uh yeah i can imagine um, I know we're getting close to time, so I'll pose a couple of questions that we've been asked in the Q&A. Um, how, if a journalist wants to learn about their own country's position, what do you think is the best way for them to find that out? Some of the, sometimes the bureaucracy can be quite complicated. It's hard to know who to ask about this. And also there's a question about M geographically moving MPAs, is there going to be a component in the treaty that will allow for MPAs to actually move with the migration of marine species? You tackle the first, I'll tackle the second. Well, just to that, I just shared the link just to say, so the High Seas Alliance has just started a new initiative on uh, nine high seas MPA areas that we think will be, should be the first to come under um, the BB&J Treaty's authority. One of them, I just, um, it hasn't been announced really yet, but it's on our website, but will be the um, uh, 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 Costa Rica Dome, which is the moving. So that is one of the ones that we would hope to, to see um, um, in, in, in uh, future years um, taken, taken up by the BB&J body. Um, the first question, remind me, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I've lost track with the first question. Um, um, so how do journalists learn about their own country's uh, positions? That's, you know, there isn't anything um, public publicly um, available um, on specific positions. I'm trying to think even on, there is a Duwalis website that has, I can try to share this link. It's the, it's the website for all, um, everything related to BBNJ done by the Division of Ocean and Law of the Sea. And there may be statements in there, but it's hard to know what current positions are. They're really not um, very public. Um, I would say, um, I don't know, Christina, what are your thoughts on that? How to help, what's the best way? Of <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, um, composite text of all the um, submissions that were made on the draft text of the treaty, and that's about 500 pages. And each um, on each article, each government could submit what their preferred text would be. It's probably pretty impenetrable. So I would suggest contacting Peggy and myself, and we can try to direct you possibly to some better resources. And in terms of um, mobile marine protected areas, right now we'd be looking at um, sort of marine protected areas together with wider planning uh, to enable to have um, a variety of area-based management tools. For example, migratory species, you may need to flip ship routing measures off and on, depending yeah. on the presence or absence of a species. If you're trying to prevent bycatch, you may just need to flip those bycatch reduction measures on and off when the species are present. Um, climate change is messing up the migratory paths of many species, um, which is why the science, the tagging and tracking and um, better understanding of their environmental requirements is so essential. But we have to hope that in terms of designing climate smart MPAs and networks, we can start to incorporate things that move. Okay. This has been great. I, I do realize we're close to time. So I'd like to give each of our panelists uh, a final minute or so to share their final reflections uh, and, and talk perhaps about what stories they think journalists should be doing. And also there's a question, a, last, a late question about where journalists can get data. So if you have thoughts on that, can share that too. Uh, I'll just mention before we wrap up, thank you to again to our panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion. There's a lot more to, to talk about, I know. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, please look out for a recording of this webinar will be made available. Uh, once again, there are story grants available for all journalists. So please spread the word about that. You can find information on 
earthjournalism.net website. And we're also gonna be sending everyone a survey that we kindly ask you to fill out just to let us know how useful this webinar was or anything we can do to improve it. So please take just a moment to fill out that survey. But now I'm gonna turn it back over to the panelists. I will go in the order of presentation. So Christina, maybe you can kick things off, please. Thanks. Well, I'll start out by saying ocean security is central and um, foremost in terms of climate security. Uh, the ocean absorbs most of the heat. Um, ocean security is central to environmental security. Uh, it's embracing most of the biodiversity um, on the planet, in fact, um, as well as supporting important fisheries, supporting important um, oxygen, as uh, Peggy has said. Um, we, we need a clean and healthy environment if we as humans are to survive. And the oceans are also central to human security. Uh, economic enterprises need certainty on how they're gonna operate. We need social security. We need to make sure the conditions of people operating are, at sea are humane. And it's also about coastal security, overfishing, um, extraction of um, large chunks of biomass, as well as interaction with endangered species harms coastal communities and their fisheries and their economies. Uh, so we need to look at this holistically from bottom to top, as well as in the atmosphere. And what we're doing right now at the BBNJ agreement is putting the ocean front and center. And we hope you'll join us there. Thanks. Peggy. Yes, thank you. Well, I would just say it's been really difficult to amplify to the public about a treaty process. I mean, it's just not a sexy thing, right? Like, how do you? It, it's very difficult, and so um, we really welcome your your help at this critical stage. This really is a once in a generation opportunity to bring governance into the high seas. We've all been working on it for twenty years, and if if, if this doesn't turn into something that really fills the gaps and, and changes status quo, we won't have another chance in, in I would say, at least another generation. So um, to the extent you can amplify to the public and find those stories, I've just shared a link about a youth ambassadors that we have. We, we chose 15 youth ambassadors from all around the world, a competitive program from, we got um, 100 applications from 50 countries and they're active in their, in their countries. They've just released their own declaration on what they wanna see in the high seas. They're meeting with their governments. So that's an interesting story. Um, there's a lot and, and, and welcome, you know, just reach out at, uh, to me and I can put you in touch with lots of folks, but thank you for your interest on this. Thank you again, Peggy and Shannon. Um, yeah, I guess I, I think Peggy and um, and Katrina nailed it. Uh, but um, I, you know, the the thing that I always look for is how to make this local or national or relevant to my audience, whoever that audience is. So if it's more of a local audience and you are coastal, um, go down to the docks, talk to talk to your local fishers um, and find out what, what they're facing, uh, what they're up against. And often you can kind of trace that right back up to um, what's, what's happening in this high seas negotiation. Um, another really important unfolding story uh, that's been mentioned multiple times is deep sea mining. Um, and there's always a story around, you know, this shift to a more sustainable future and the fact that a lot of those minerals are um, now being looked for at the bottom of the ocean and maybe not the most sustainable way. Um, so that's a global story. And the final one to kind of bring it home to, to your audience is seafood fraud. So um, that's something that no matter where you are, if you're in the middle of the country, if you're in the mountains, um, there's a, a good chance that a lot of the, the salmon in particular and tuna in particular, but a lot of the high value um, species that we see on our plates might not actually be what we think they are. And a lot of that reason, the reason for that um, comes back to this lack of governance. So um, you can always kind of trace this all the way back up to these really critical negotiations. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you to, again to all our panelists for joining us. This is just a, a wealth of information and uh, a lot to think about as our, journal, our audience, hopefully, for those of you in the audience, journalists, you will uh, send your ideas in, your applications for story grants. We're looking forward to hearing about your ideas. We'll be sharing a recording of this video with everyone who has registered for the webinar. And we will be doing another webinar later in the year, probably featuring many of the stories uh, that are, we expect will be produced. So thanks again to all of you who have attended and keep those stories rolling.
Take care, everyone. Bye Thank you now. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay well. Thank you, everyone.